Welcome to the eighth episode of our special edition MindShift video series. I'm David Chuaku, and the purpose of MindShift is to help you create atomic shifts in your mind so that you can unleash your creative genius and live your life with more prosperity, fulfillment, and appreciation. Today's topic is focus and productivity. How can we actually uh, become focused and productive in this time when everything wants to take your attention? You have TV, you have social media, people around you, the weather, everything is taking your attention. And you don't know, sometimes you don't know how to actually come back and focus on the things you want. A study which was done in 2019 by Microsoft shows that our attention span is eight seconds. Can you imagine? We have eight seconds and after that we start looking for something to get our attention. So how can we actually extend it? How can we actually expand that? And how can we actually become more focused and productive to achieve our goals, but also to have fun throughout the process? So the, today's expert, I'm sure, is going to give so many tips and tricks to help to us with that. So I'm going to give the word to my amazing and very productive co-host, Laura, to introduce our expert and mind shifter today. Thank you, Dimi. And very, very warm welcome to our mind shift show, Katie. I would like to present you in, in a few words, which is always a very complicated task. <laughs> so today on our show, we have Katie Stoddard, who is the founder of her own business called The Focus Bee. And I think it also says a lot about you, Katie, The Focus. Katie is an award-winning international high-performance coach, mainly Katie works with the founders and executives to support them in sustaining their peak performance in their own businesses. And it's with a big pleasure that I am welcoming you today to our session, Katie. And just to start on the light note, from you, from your point of view as an expert, what is focus and what is productivity? Thank you, Laura, for the introduction, and thank you, Demi, for having me on the show. Great point to begin with, defining the actual key terms. So in my perspective, focus is really about how we manage our attention and energy. So it's how we are managing our attention every single day, both in a work context and outside of work. But to manage our attention, this also means having peak levels of energy, because otherwise we can't be fully focused. So I often look at focus management as attention management. And in terms of productivity, it's really quite simple. Productivity for me anyway, means to reach what you want, <laughs> to reach the goals and objectives you have for yourself with intention. And this can both mean in your personal life outside of work and at work. For instance, having a productive weekend for me doesn't mean achieving all of your work goals. It means maybe you've done the hike you wanted to do, maybe you tidied your home, maybe you saw the few friends you wanted to. So it really is about reaching your expectations and the goals that you desire, both in your work life and your private life. Very productive welcome and explanation of focus <laughs> and productivity. I love that. Uh, so we are up now to talk and dive into the, uh, the topic. So uh, when I heard here about uh, focus on productivity, the first thing which is coming in my mind is how can we measure it? And how can actually measure something, I guess, um, which can help us to become more focused and also to get our goals, I guess, more effectively, efficiently and faster. And um, actually the main question here is how good is good enough? How can you actually understand that? Those are three different questions. So how do we yeah. measure our focus? How do we measure our productivity? And when is it actually good enough? Mm. Uh, measuring productivity, I think, is quite simple if we have clearly defined targets. So if you've decided mm. for Monday today, you were going to have this show, write one article and do three coaching sessions. If you do all of this, you have been productive. So it really is about meeting those expectations. Measuring how focused you are is slightly more challenging, 
but it's having that extra awareness when you're getting distracted because the opposite of being focused is being distracted. So essentially, if you're being a lot less distracted, this means you're a lot, less fo a lot more focused. So by noticing when you are suddenly clicking on social media, when you wanted to be writing your article, for instance, you're less focused. So looking for how long can you really just do one activity, single task, not get distracted by your thoughts. So this is more challenging to measure in a scientific way, but we can have a general awareness about it. And your last question was different in terms of what is actually good enough. And this is how we set our goals and our targets. And what happens a lot of the time is people set too high goals, too high expectations, and they don't actually manage to achieve their to-do list for the week or the day. And then they get discouraged and they feel counterproductive. So I generally encourage people to put a lot less on their to-do list, a lot less on the week. And it's so much more satisfying and it gives you so much more of a energy and dopamine boost if you put less on and you achieve all of it and then if you have extra space extra energy you can always add more things it's better that way round than having a ton of things on not doing all of them and yes and it forces you to really prioritize if you put less things on your plate mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's super relevant actually and I relate extremely well with this idea of putting less on your agenda. The way I function and I found that it works for me is I always have one key task for the day, in some cases two, so one before lunch, one after lunch. And then I have a bunch of things like tasks, like reminders, which emotionally mean that if I can't manage, if I can't handle, it's completely fine to move it to another day. Um, and that, that's why it, it's, it's actually very, very interesting. On the other hand, I also relate very well with that, um, with that feeling when you suddenly catch yourself scrolling something or replying like a lot of emails at the same time. And so this is, this is where I think a lot of struggle comes for, for many people. So my question would be very practically thinking, top three, top five, your, you know, your wisdom tips for if for people to be more focused and more productive, what should everyone do? I'll answer that question with focus to begin with anyway. Mm -hmm. Three key tips would be number one, every time you feel distracted, either by a thought or you want to do something else, writing it down. So having a pen and paper next to you and every single time you think, I really want to Google this. You pause and you get into the habit of writing it down instead of clicking, because this will train you to not succumb to the distraction. That's one thing. Second of all, to be more focused, we all need to take a lot more breaks. So there's this thing called the ultradian cycle. And this means that hormonally speaking, every time we're focused and we're working, like we're doing right now for this hour, after this, if you were to get on let's say a coaching session call for another hour and a half just afterwards, you wouldn't be able to be as focused because while you're working at a, let's say, high level energetically, your cells are producing a lot of things. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on. And then you need this extra break for your brain to sort of declutter. It's a bit like tidying after making a mess. <laughs> and yeah. I used to think we needed a five minute break. So I was always telling my clients and on my posts, work for an hour, take a five minute break and sort of Pomodoro style or work for mm. half an hour, take five minutes. But actually the Ultradian cycle, and I learned this recently with Imogen Roy in a clubhouse room we were hosting. She explains that it's actually 15 to 20 minutes every 90 minutes. So I thought, oh, I have to take even longer breaks. And this is the time you need to regenerate and yes, get rid of all the rubbish so you can focus again officially. So that's my second tip to take more breaks. And my third one is to single task. So if we're multitasking, we can't be as focused. It's physiologically not possible. We're, when we're multitasking, we're opening all these small windows in our brain and we can't give it the same attention. Imagine if you were interviewing me now and at the same time you were scrolling Facebook on your phone, <laughs> how would you be able to ask the next question? How would you process the information, right? So those would be the three things. Write down the distractions when they come to you 
and keep them for the very end of the day before you leave. You might also notice in those moments that half of these things you don't even want to look up anymore. <laughs> might be like, oh, actually, I'm not interested in that. And that's one thing. Then taking breaks a lot more often and single tasking. That's lovely. So, um, yeah, definitely I've heard about uh, this um, cycle you set about 90 minutes and then you have 15, 15 to 20 minutes breaks. And I've tried it. I, and it's, it works because actually it's really, um, as you said, our brain just needs this time to remove everything out of it. And, and, but here the thing is the discipline, right? To be disciplined in this, uh, in this, to do it, you know, because I mean, in my coaching practice also, uh, when I work with clients, uh, uh, we talk about simple things and then you, you want to get disciplined with that. Uh, and really remember to do it and really because we, we are working out of habits right and then you just go through life sometimes also I'm catching myself when I'm really interested in the task I forget to take the breaks because you just do how do you do that actually before I ask the next question just this is a short question for you um, do you have some reminders you do for yourself or you help your clients to do because it seems simple but I guess a lot of people don't do it, right? Yes, so, great yeah. point about the self-discipline, you're right. I think this is this is the irony that it yeah. actually takes more self-discipline to have a break than to work, <laughs> right? Yeah. You think we need more self-discipline <laughs> to work, but it's actually the self-discipline you need to get away from the screen because it's quite mm -hmm. hypnotic and actually get up and it breaks the pattern that you used to for people who aren't used to taking breaks it does take quite a bit of self-discipline there are different ways you can go about it you can use things like pomodoro and mm. set it you can set it to different times so you can set it to 30 mm. minutes 45 minutes an hour depending on the task you're doing and then take 5 10 15 minute breaks it depends on the person the most important thing is not to do anything sort of technology related in those mm. breaks because that doesn't uh, slow down the attention. Like it doesn't give the attention a break. Um, it maybe feels a break because it's not stressful or it's fun or it's entertaining, but it doesn't actually rest your mind. <laughs> so it doesn't work. Um, going for a walk is a really nice one. And yeah, that's kind of my favorite. Uh, getting up, drinking some water, walking around. Yes, that's the best. Okay, and in terms of other ways of doing it, so there's Pomodoro that you can use or the way I like to do it, I do it more sort of organically, which is in between big tasks. So before getting on a call with you guys, taking a five, 10 minute break, then afterwards taking a five, 10 minute break, you do it every time before a call and after a call and before a big task. Like if you're writing an article, for instance, just before taking five minute break and when you finish taking one, it does take discipline though, because if you finish the article, you might suddenly get inspired for something else or an email. And I'm not saying I manage every single time. <laughs> Sometimes I get carried away and I'm like, oh, I'll just do this 15 minutes and another hour goes by and I was like, yeah, the break. Oh yes. But with practice and with building the habit, it does become a lot more automatic and you do end up having more breaks and longer time and then being more focused and productive. And if you want to work long days, so for people who either have a lot of calls during the day or that's the sort of days they work, to finish the day feeling still quite energized, this is only possible if you take breaks. I've compared and done both lots of times. <laughs> if you just work all in one go with a 15 minute lunch break or if you work every hour or hour and a half you take 15 20 minutes and you have a half an hour or hour lunch break then you can work 10 to 12 hours and literally you don't feel shattered at the end of the day because you're giving yourself that time throughout it's like a marathon <laughs> instead of a sprint <laughs> exactly and uh, actually there is um, for the high achievers i always say that uh, it's a great idea make it as uh, achievement i mean i have made today like five breaks that's achievement i won i made it you know, I like that. I like that. I, I, could, I could make it happen. So it's like, I'm going to uh, do that. We're going to be like, yes, break, done. Yeah. <laughs> Just check, 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 you know. 
<laughs> that's good that's good it's like a perspective shift because loads of people feel that taking a break is a waste of time and they're not being productive and it's slowing them down and it's not true but if you see it that way i like that i like that like mindset <laughs> mindset change. Yeah. yeah it just because uh, you know i've heard so many stories when people use these techniques like you shared with us these techniques and uh, people who are writing books they were in like outer block and then they go through these techniques and they write the book in several days because they have, and they say even they work less hours, like five hours or something like this per day and they make it happen. So it's, these things work. I just want to make sure that people understand that they really work. Just we need to be disciplined and great points from your side to how we can actually make it happen. So now uh, what about uh, um, uh, the, morning and evening routines this is some some great topic i think i've noticed in my life which helped me a lot with productivity and focus but what about you what do you think about that and of course you can give like top tips like three tips for morning tips for evening what we can do in order to enhance our productivity yes i really like this topic and i think it's hugely important both for focus productivity but not just that also for feeling happy fulfilled calm it contributes in a lot of areas. I'll begin actually with the evening routine because the thing is why one of the reasons they're both so important is because it helps you to prioritize your own well-being and health. And this also is linked to sleep. So the evening routine would then begin with deciding by what time you physically want to be in bed. And a lot of people don't think this way. They think, by what time do I want to actually get up? Mm. And then they just sort of go to bed when they feel like it. <laughs> But yeah. if you think about it, when we were children, our parents would say like, it's bedtime and it would be at the fixed time every day. And when we do this, especially if normally we're night owls and we struggle to fall asleep, when we do this, it makes it so much easier for us to fall asleep. I know myself that when I just go to bed at any old time or when I feel like it, sometimes it takes me an hour or two to fall asleep. But if I make it 10 o'clock every single night, I'll fall asleep immediately because your body gets used to it. So that would be one thing that you can begin with the night before. And then obviously the, the classics, <laughs> such as turning off technology a couple of hours, at least before going to bed, eating early, so you're not digesting as much during the night, and maybe reading a bit or something relaxing and soothing, so that your brain slowly unwinds <laughs> and you relax. Uh, this is generally what I do. So my evening routine isn't very complicated. I just fix myself the time I go to bed and an hour to two hours before then I'm reading and writing my diary, talking with my husband. That's about it. <laughs> those, are, those are my evenings. Very simple, <laughs> but yeah. it helps me to fall asleep and I enjoy reading in the evenings. You're not supposed to read nonfiction. I still do that, but <laughs> let's not go there. I do a mixture. <laughs> generally, I have my nonfiction book at about 15 minutes before going to bed, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll switch to fiction. <laughs> Just <before. laughs> uh, I like both. Anyway, so the morning routine is really interesting because it sets the tone for your day. So once you've actually gotten your eight hours of sleep, then you can start the day in a way that energizes you. Recently, I've started doing the morning pages, which is a creativity and um, sort of releasing tool from Julia Cameron. Really, really like that. So that consists in writing three pages every single morning as soon as you wake up about anything, <laughs> your dreams, your thoughts, your ideas. This is great. It really okay. releases a lot of things. It's quite a powerful tool. Then meditation. This helps a lot, especially if you know people are aiming to be focused and productive during the day because obviously it's a tool to help you strengthen your attention. And yes, any form of exercise, stretching, I do some yoga, yeah. And then I have a cold shower, Wim Hof. So my morning routine for those who are interested is morning pages, uh, uh, morning pages, meditation, sometimes with a nap, sometimes without, 15, 20 minutes yoga, cold shower, breakfast. That's my morning routine. But yes, people don't have to do all of this. I'd say the most important are, uh, in my point of view, I mean, and hydration, drink water, uh, is uh, exercise and meditation. They, for me, I think those are the most important. Why are they more, the most important? What, uh, what the, brain, the brain and the body, right? <laughs> the meditation <Yeah. laughs> for the brain and the, the, the yoga or stretching or exercise, even if it's 
literally, even if it's five minute meditation and five minute Tabata, because the five minute meditation means you start in a non reactive way, not like scrolling your phone. It begins with attention, awareness, focus. You can even have affirmations or project how you want to spend your day or visualization during your meditation. And then the exercise, because it wakes up your body. So it mm. gets your body moving, flowing, especially for people working from home. I have the privilege to have my own office in a co-working space. So my walk in the morning also energizes me. But for people who just get out of bed and go on the computer, <laughs> your body's not awake. <laughs> you can't fully function. So, yes. I would like to ask you to elaborate on the evening routines. And the reason I'm asking that is because... I hope people can relate to me, but I think when we wake up, okay, it's a new page, it's a new day, everything is relatively clean. I do my morning routine, you know, the cold shower, meditation, breakfast. I start the day until lunch. I am a crazy, like productivity, you know, star. Lunch comes, all is great. And after lunch, my problems start. So <laughs> I really, and this incredibly, like it's extreme difference. After lunch, there are two struggles. First, I guess my energy levels naturally go down. So I'm first struggling with staying in the flow, hence staying productive on the tasks. And as the evening comes, I, I always say I should do meditation to kind of wrap up my day in the same mindful state like I started. But I fail because then there is something unfinished, then I have to to you know yeah cross off this task for the day as well and so my question is really more about the second half of a day after lunch to keep productive to keep in the flow do you have any special advice yes i'm like you i function more efficiently in the morning than in the afternoon different things so first of all like i was saying earlier taking more breaks i realized that around 3 p.m is my least productive moment of the day. It's literally the moment where I have that dip. And so the best thing for me to do is actually not to be working at that moment from maybe five to three to quarter past three uh, to take some time out. And then generally I'm re-motivated and energized for the last two, three, four hours, what, whatever it is. Or, and maybe this would work for you, Laura, I don't know, but in my case, I try and have more calls in the afternoon and more tasks in the morning because you don't need the same amount of focus and attention you also need it but it's different to task them we're, we're people people <laughs> so we get energized through talking to people so i know in my case i try to do the harder tasks at least in the morning and if i still have tasks in the afternoon take more breaks do easier ones i try not to do the big stuff so when i'm working on my book for instance i've already scheduled it before in the past in the afternoon it never works <laughs> i've decided if i'm not writing in the morning it's out for the day so knowing what times and what tasks work for you that's for the afternoon i like what you said about the evening and doing a meditation i've always wanted to do that i'm like i'm going to meditate in the end of the day and the evening i still don't do it i might but uh, i think that's really nice and what you said about there's all the things that are unfinished this feels to me like a boundary issue. So this feels to me like you haven't decided for yourself as of when you're either stopping to work or you're stopping finishing things in the household. But if you decided by 8 p.m., it's relaxed time. And maybe it means, you know, a movie, maybe it means a book, maybe it means an instrument, maybe it means whatever it means to you. But past that time, you won't do anything that's on the computer or where you need to think. So this feels to me like it's a boundary thing. That is actually wonderful. I think we're touching upon the, the, the habits. The, I really, really like what you say about matching the tasks with your best energy during the day. Like, like in your case, I also relate that mental, cognitive, the most demanding tasks first half. That is, I think, very personal. It could be the other way around, but me too and then the second half is more creative more like connecting with people so it leads to to the next thing about habits 
in order to obviously building on top of what we already discussed about the breaks, right? About just what habits could everyone train to be productive during their working hours, right? So besides besides the break, something in the mindset or attitude or a habit. A few things. First of all, breaks are hugely important, but I know you said aside from the break, I'm like, breaks, 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 just because people don't take enough. I, two things come to my mind most. One of them is obviously meditating. And so when you train meditation, what, what happens is if you're meditating, you have this higher self-awareness. And from this place of higher self-awareness, it's a lot easier to be productive because you can't lie to yourself anymore. You can't say, I'm doing this because it matters. But your, your self-awareness and that attention will help you to realize faster that you're going down the rabbit hole of something that's not important. Meditation is huge. And another aspect is being intentional. So before opening the computer, before starting any task, before anything you do, thinking, why am I doing this? What do I want to achieve? Is this my main priority right now? And these questions can be a bit draining, which is why people just go on autopilot and check their emails, <laughs> because it's easier to do that than to actually ask yourself these questions, mm -hmm. to ask which task shall I focus on? And sometimes, and I've done this, I've taken hours and hours off because I wasn't clear about my priorities. And I thought, yes, I can start any random task. There's a bunch of things I can do, but I'm not sure that's my main priority. And being disciplined again about allowing also yourself to take that time out to figure out your priorities is something a lot of people don't do. Yeah, absolutely. So I have several more questions. I would just start with the first one. Uh, I, I was uh, thinking, that um, you've spoken about the goals and you know the to-do list and everything, but there is this, I think, very confusing um, way uh, how people see goals because goals are uh, so from the one side people say put very high goals like you just something you don't believe that maybe you can achieve, but just put it out there so that you can get it and you just you know raise your uh, energy and just uh, you know go over your um, how is the word uh, you, to make the, this big leap you know and the other people say just put more goals so that you can start doing stuff and just, otherwise maybe it will be too big too big so I'm really curious how you see that because I think this has a lot to do with productivity especially with productivity uh, I've noticed for myself that sometimes if I put something which is super not achievable uh, for me, it goes against my productivity. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, if it's something very small, it, I cannot be motivated for it. So just, just, I just put it out there for you and let me know what your opinion about it. Yeah, I, I agree <laughs> with you 100% on this, Timmy. I think it has to be the right level of challenge. If it's too easy, it's boring, it's not motivating enough, it doesn't give us that dopamine. If it's too challenging, then we can feel discouraged. And I agree. I've also read and seen a lot of times people saying you have to write or say or work towards these huge goals that seem incredible and super hard. And I don't know. I think it has to feel exciting and challenging and out of your comfort zone. But I've noticed that if it's really too far out, there's a, there's a sort of self-sabotage that happens and... Um, the fear becomes too great and you can work on this, mm -hmm. but you're making it harder for yourself. It's easy if you set something out there that's challenging and exciting and, and still hard to get, but you can still imagine and working towards that, I feel is more productive, more rewarding, more sustainable than having this huge goal, but let's say in five years, but a small part of you doesn't believe it's possible, then you'll have to be working on your mindset all the time. Mm. And yes, it's possible. And yes, you can still do it. But why not put a like slightly easier one in one year and work towards that? So I'm, I'm all for breaking it down. Uh, same with writing my book. I try not to think, okay, I want my book to be a New York Times bestseller. I'm like, okay, I want to finish my next two chapters. <laughs> I, mean, like, I want to publish it one point. And, you know, it's one step at a time, I also think is hugely relevant. I just uh, remember Tony Robbins, I, th I think he said that um, people 
underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years time and they overestimate what they can achieve for a year. So that's also something very, you know, how our mind works. And uh, it was very relevant for me when I was, when I started. So, yeah. Mm, uh, I agree. Um, I like that saying too. It, so don't, yes. Sort of understanding the timeline of how long things can take and working with that and not getting jeopardized by fantasy and unrealistic expectations because then you end up disappointed also so finding that right balance is it's tricky but everyone has their own journey to figure it out <laughs> yeah it's um and you said disappointed that's my next question what do we do with emotions i think this is one of the things which stay on the way of our productivity because they share that I think there was a study which showed that there were like 90 something percent of our decisions coming from emotion because people say we are logical built. We have logic, definitely. We are rational. But, but they say that normally we take our, you know, make decisions and go in directions based on the emotions. And um, from your experience, how do we deal with them and how actually, especially, I guess, with the negative one, uh, which yeah. are coming our way? Yes, this is such a relevant topic and it's true in general for productivity or high performance, peak performance, uh, emotions have a huge role. Uh, Tony Robbins also says, you know, the quality of our life and the quality of our emotions, which basically means that you can achieve all the goals you want to, but if you feel like shit every day, then what's the point? <laughs> so I think the, the important part here is also looking at how things make you feel. And it comes back to enjoying the process, enjoying the journey and not being too fixated on the goal. And I know for myself, I previously had a tendency to really just set a goal or an outcome, have it in my mind's eye. And that was all I was aiming for. And it's almost like I forgot that every single day, every single step was actually enjoyable. And when you reach that goal, it lasts five seconds. <laughs> I mean, when you actually get that diploma <laughs> that goes through the marathon finish line or triathlon or whatever it is, it's a five second thing. It's five minutes. But the journey is every day. It's hours and hours and hours. So what's the point in not enjoying this part just for those five minutes? And they might not even be that great. So to come back to what you're saying, I think it's about managing our emotions through the journey, throughout the process. And this can come again through meditation, but also awareness, through breathing, so through really understanding also where we are in our bodies. You know, if we've been really sleep deprived or if we're going through physical changes for whatever reason, people who have illnesses or pregnancies or wherever people are in their life and in their journey, this has an impact physiologically on them, but also that's the, the body part, but also the mental part. So things like the pandemic, the, these have a mental effect on how we function and our emotions. So understanding these and accepting instead of trying to push it away. I know that a lot of hyperachievers, they don't want to accept they have these type of emotions because it interferes with the results. It's like, no, I want to be super productive today. Do this, this, this. <laughs> I can't feel down because X. And I was like this, I would always shove away any negativity because I felt that I always had to be in a peak state. And at one point I realized, no, actually, <laughs> what it's really about is acknowledging and accepting when you are a bit low and not staying there forever. You still find ways to go back up, but you don't shortcut it too quickly because you need time for your body or your mind to heal a bit. So it, again, it's finding that balance of, you might allow yourself half a day or a few hours to take it slowly. That doesn't mean you're like crying and collapsing all day. <laughs> that might just mm -hmm. mean that you're going at a slower pace or taking more breaks or finishing a bit earlier or whatever it is. So that then you can build up again your energy <laughs> bottle <laughs> and then you're like back, back on fire. But if you try and pretend that the energy isn't depleted and like, no, I am feeling great. I am feeling great. Then you're not. You're just lying to yourself and you're pushing your body. And that's how you get sick. I mean, that's how people get physically ill. And I have in the past just from pushing yourself and ignoring that you, your body sometimes is healing. You know, it might have a virus or bacteria and it might need a bit of space and time and you don't fall ill. You take a longer weekend, 
you sleep a bit more and then the next week you're great but if you push 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 you might fall ill for two weeks or get burned out so really that is actually very counterproductive <laughs> i don't know if this answers your question i thought went from emotions to like how you manage your mental state to how you know you could get burnt out but i'm all for really listening to ourselves i think is the the message really listen and and just understand and accept where we're at I think it's, it makes so much sense and it's all so interrelated because what I think often happens is when that emotion comes and if we have a tendency to, no, I'm not feeling bad, I'm ignoring it, what happens is that emotion is like a ghost, you know, dragging throughout the day with you and that kills your, at mm. least, I, I believe that kills your enjoyment of what you're doing because you are like, okay, but I'm doing good stuff but you're feeling so drained because of that ghost following you. And sometimes what happens, you get things done and you, you, you weren't in the present moment. You have no idea. Wait, I wrote that email. Let me reread. What did I write exactly? Because so much attention is taken by that ghost. So what I really love, and I think it also comes from a Tony Robbins when he says, you know, take that emotion for a dance. Some people say, Give, give that emotion a big hug, embrace it. Take a step back, acknowledge, embrace, breathe in and continue with the tasks because if not, you're losing your life basically in simple terms, you know? Mm. <laughs> so so just, just a very, very last um, thing because I know every time I speak with Katie, we somehow arrive to this point is about the distractions and uh, especially external distractions <laughs> because we are all, you know, so cool and we can take care of our inner state and be productive but just you know briefly personally some good advice on external distractions and how not to let them ruin your productivity it feels to me like the reason you always come back to this is, is to do with acceptance so a lot of the time they aren't magic tricks yes you can put boundaries yes you can tell people from this time to this time i'm unavailable you can do things like turn your phone off and close the door but most of the time, I imagine you had four kids running around the house and they kept knocking at your door. I can give you all the tips in the world, but mostly if you just accept, take care of whatever they need and go back, you save a lot of energy. I feel that internal distractions are actually what most people struggle most with when they end up on YouTube instead of working, that's internal distractions because they're looking for something to compensate for their energy being low. But external distractions... 90% of the time, I think it's acceptance and letting go. If you're working from home mm. and this works outside and they're making a hell of a noise, a lot of noise, <laughs> I can't give you productivity tips. I can't tell you how to make these guys go away. <laughs> I mean, sure, maybe you can get up and go to a coffee place, but there might not be any nearby. It might not work for you. The best thing you can do is accept, let go. And there might be mm. some calls you need to ca and flexibility. There might be some things you need to change, readapt. The kids interrupt, maybe you need to take that hour out and work longer. If there's works nearby making noise, maybe you need to cancel those calls and put them a different day. So ad adapt, accept and adapt. There we go. Accept and adapt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and before asking the last question, um, tell me about the plants. Plants is a very important part of productivity. I guess you can make some kind of plan and do stuff, but some people just go with a plan like super rigidly. I have to do everything. I have to make it happen. And it just becomes so a lot of tension around these people that they just, uh, you know, do it because they have to do it. And there are some people, of course, they are super flexible and they don't care about anything which is happening. I put the plan and nothing is done after the day because... So where is the balance there? I mean, because I think this is something I've been struggling closely in my life. I think this depends, first of all, on personalities. Some people like to do a plan and stick by it. And some people like to do a plan for inspiration, ideas, a general roadmap, but maybe they don't need to stick to it so much. And then there's also start to end planners and end to start. So start to end planners are people who begin and adapt as they go along and figure out the plan as they move forward. I'm like that. <laughs> When mm. I started my podcast, I thought about it a few weeks, did it all in one go. And as I was going along, I bought a mic, I bought a webcam, I changed a few things, but I just began it. 
that's start to end. Now, into star planners, if they're starting a podcast, for instance, they'll look, what's the end result they want? And mm. they'll reverse engineer it and look at all the steps. Okay, so I'll need a mic and I'll need a, a webcam and I'll do this. And so they'll go backwards. What happens is enter star planners generally procrastinate and it takes them a while to begin. But when they do, they've got it all figured out <laughs> because it's been six months or a year and they have it all planned. So they have the best equipment, the, the fantastic guests. They have 10 episodes. They launch all in one go. Maybe they get to number one on YouTube. I don't know. But mm. they... I said YouTube, I meant in the podcast, I meant iTunes, but mm. this is what happens with enter starts. It takes them longer to begin, but then they have things figured out. Start to end people, they start faster and they're super energized where they struggle most is to continue. Mm. So often they start a lot of different projects yeah. <laughs> and then, ah, oh, this is boring now. Let me start something else. So I know in my case as a huge start to end person, I've worked extremely hard on finishing things or some things might not have a finish per se, like a podcast, but then having something that makes sense for me, a certain amount of episodes or a certain amount of time and not just starting and stopping. So those are two ways in which people plan. And in terms of planning for the day or planning for the week, which is slightly different than planning for a project, then it's a matter of, I think it's a really a matter of experimenting. So starting maybe with, three tasks a day, like you were saying, Laura, maybe one in the morning, one in the afternoon. How does that work for you? Or do you not like having a plan? What I realized for myself, which is interesting as a productivity coach, I have a huge uh, rebel energy. If we look at the four tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. So what happens is if I put a task in my diary, I will actually do another one because it's a bit like a rebel kid, you know, do this. No, I don't want to do that. I'll do that. And at first I'd feel really guilty about it. Like oh, I planned these tasks today and I'm not actually doing them and I'd feel bad. And then I realized, no, I get more energy by doing other tasks than the ones I plan. So this is very messed up, but you can be productive this way if you still do your tasks for the week. So if you've got your main goals for the week, it doesn't really matter which ones you do on Monday or on Thursday, if there aren't any clients or people involved, that never works, that never happens to me, obviously. Deadlines with people involved is different. But if it's for yourself, then you can do them in different orders. What I'm saying is you can be flexible if you trust yourself, is basically the main key. If you trust yourself and you still reach your monthly goals or your weekly goals, it doesn't matter if you wrote your book on Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning, basically. Yeah, absolutely. So before I ask you the last question, I just want to really um, thank you for, for your time today. Thank you for your practical and very focused tips on the topic. And uh, I'm sure that people will get a lot out of it because, yeah, it was like, boom, boom, boom. This is the things you can do, simple things. So now people who are listening to uh, our video series, they don't have an excuse when it comes to focus on productivity because you actually gave them the tips and tricks which i believe if they do their productivity will really skyrocket so uh thank you for that thank you for your you know attention focus tips and everything and the last question is uh, very simple if someone wants now to become more uh, productive more focused in their life what, is the f what are the first three steps they can take so that they can go in this direction? Work with intention. So ask mm -hmm. yourself, what are all your priorities? What are your goals? Have an overview of your life. That would be the first thing. Second of all, we've said it a million times, so I'm going to repeat it, take breaks. <laughs> the more people take real breaks, the more they'll notice it. Their productivity will really go through the roof. And the last step would be review. So at the end of every week, take one, two, three hours to review your week, review your goals, review how you spent your time, because you won't be able to see if your focus and productivity are getting better unless you conscientious, conscientiously, <laughs> consciously <laughs> review it and make an effort to actually review this at the end of every week. So it'll be set the intention, work in a focused way by taking breaks, and by having clear objectives and single tasking and then reviewing at the end of the week. 
That is really beautiful. And I think I'd like to add one last thing. It's something I learned from Katie some time ago, which, uh, which was like, wow. It's, um, you know how much we speak about abundance of money? <laughs> Katie once told me, think about abundance of time. So time abundance, I think it was, it's a very, very brilliant way of looking into life because it's true, as we said, to stay focused and productive, we have to plan, take breaks, see where we are efficient, adjust our energy to tasks, review. All these things are ex essential. While at the same time, we said there are things we can't control. There are external distractions, right? So it's a very nice reminder that even though we have a brilliant golden plan, when life happens, it's okay. And we have to remember we have all the time in the world, abundance, abundance, and we have to react from, from the place of abundance. So thanks for this, Katie. And thank you for all, all the rest, you know, practical tips that you have shared today. Super, super important topic. And um, just uh, knowing the fact that I'm sure people will be interested, you know, in getting to know more. How could everyone who wants contact you? Sure. The, I use two main platforms, which is my website, thefocusb.com. So www.thefocusb.com. People can also find my podcasts on that website. And it's also on Spotify and Apple and YouTube and all of that <laughs> and uh, on LinkedIn. So mostly my website and LinkedIn and LinkedIn, it's Katie Stoddart. So those are the two platforms. If people want to be in touch, I'd be happy to answer any questions they have and also hear their main insight. I'm always really curious. What was the main nugget people took away from the conversation? Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And uh, wish you to have a great week and lots of very productive and successful. Thank Stay you focused. so much. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.